Thanksgiving. Turkey, stuffing, mashed potatoes. But the one thing that has always stood out is a bit of a head scratcher, sweet potato casserole. We're pretty sure sweet potatoes and marshmallows weren't at the original Thanksgiving, so what happened? Sweet potatoes have been around forever. And marshmallows, this sticky, gooey mess, actually comes from a plant and has been around since ancient Egypt, a delicacy only pharaohs could eat. Okay, fast forward to the 20th century. Marshmallows were a big deal, expensive, and essentially the Chris doll of sweet treats. And not only that, but they were even handmade. Marshmallows became a mainstay for highfalutin housewives. See, back then, housewives would have to make whipped cream or even meringue by hand, but the marshmallows were a modern time saver. The first recipe that paired sweet potatoes and marshmallows appeared in 1918 in a trade journal cleverly named Sweet Potatoes and Yams. As marshmallows grew in popularity and began being mass produced, more and more recipes began implementing them as an everyday ingredient. Nowadays, marshmallows are generally reserved for campfires and hot chocolate, and this non-traditional, traditional favorite. Whether you like your sweet potatoes a la marshmallow or plain, happy Thanksgiving. The very thought of Thanksgiving drums up foods worth salivating over, like stuffing, mashed potatoes, and of course, the taupe furkey. But this Thanksgiving veggie substitute wasn't just whipped up overnight, it actually took years of trial and error. So we called the guy who invented it. I am Seth Tibbet, and I am the inventor of tofurkey. Seth Tippett was living in Oregon. He was a teacher and a self-professed hippie who lived somewhere, shall we say, unusual. I built my own three-story treehouse out of scavenged wood. He was also a serious vegetarian, so serious that he started his very own tempeh-making company. And I made soy tempeh, five-grain tempeh, and a sausage tempeh called temperoni. And I just made tempeh for the first 15 years. But there was a problem. Which was finding something to eat at my own Thanksgiving. You see, at the time, there were no main dishes for vegetarians available. So Seth set out to solve the problem, and it wasn't so easy. First, he created a stuffed pumpkin. Uh, the stuffed pumpkin was the famous one that we still talk about. The whole thing on the pumpkin was that it collapsed in the oven and it seemed more like a side dish than a main dish. Then there was... The gluten roast, which was really an all-day thing, took like eight hours. Literally, it was just too tough to cut with any kind of implement that we had other than a chainsaw, which we did not bring to the table. Eventually, Seth teamed up with his friend Hans. He was making these tofu uh, roasts, had a little bit of gravy in there with them. We added the drumettes because we were mimicking the turkey and marketed it under the name Tofurkey. Throughout the years, the recipe evolved. We soon realized that this is a vegan feast and vegan plants don't have legs, so yeah, it's been a long journey. Long, strange tempeh trip, as a hippie would say. And now? Around here, we call turkey a tofurkey substitute. I can imagine us having Thanksgiving wherever we are in our universe, you know, whether it's Pluto, Mars, the moon, or, or wherever, I think as we explore as a civilization, we'll take our traditions with us and break bread in that same way. I spent Thanksgiving in space on my second space shuttle mission in 2009. There were seven astronauts total. We were like around a campfire with no campfire, but floating in the air. My Thanksgiving meal was irradiated smoked turkey. We had thermally stabilized cornbread dressing rehydrated green beans, and oh my goodness, these uh, other kind of crazy like, kind of candied yams. We always play with our food in space, so I think maybe a green bean or two was floated over and you, you know, catch the green bean, it was pretty cool. Off the planet, you're in this incredible community of explorers, and that was one thing that I really felt so connected to, is these people that I'm breaking bread with and being thankful for on Thanksgiving Day. I'm sure the pilgrims or the Native Americans probably never would have imagined 
turkey in space. Thanksgiving on Mars would be, you know, similar to being on the space station, except for your food wouldn't be floating around because there's one six G on Mars. So, you know, one sixth of the gravitational pull on the, on the planet Earth. You would have your irradiated smoked turkey on the table sitting there, not floating away. People need to understand that all of North America is indigenous land, it is native land. People tend to forget that there was a vibrant native culture um, living in all parts of North America. And food is really the piece that's going to help us move forward into a brighter future. My name is Sean Sherman and I am a chef. I own the company The Sioux Chef. So this is gonna be two pieces per plate for these. Our mission is revitalizing Native American foods and re-identifying North American cuisine. We've tried really hard to maintain authenticity by removing all of the colonial ingredients like dairy, wheat flour, processed sugar, beef, pork, chicken, and we're just using a lot of wild game, a lot of the native agricultural heirloom varietals, a lot of the wild foods around us, and really making those plates that taste like a region. Most of these ingredients are very familiar to people, but the usage of a lot of the wild plants really talk about a place and a community. We prioritize purchasing from the indigenous vendors first because we really want to open up a lot of opportunity for indigenous people growing out farms or collecting things from the wild or raising animals. So for the big dinner, we're actually uh, cooking this bison down with a bunch of fresh cedar and some bergamot. We will purchase from anybody raising these indigenous pieces because it is such an important part of the landscape and the history. I know you want it. As we travel around the country, we like to make dinners and foods that really represent those areas. What's great about being able to do these dinners, especially in non-indigenous communities, is just to bring awareness. This kind of food that we're eating today, like you're gonna feel really good when you leave here. You're not gonna feel heavy and weighted down. You're gonna feel energized and just happy because you're knowing where this food is coming from. We feel like Anybody across North America will benefit from the understanding of the indigenous food systems around you, and it's all gonna help us move forward. There's lots of amazing food in the Philippines, but there's one amazing culinary tradition that's big enough to feed an army. Hi, I'm Jack, and I own Boodle Fight Manila. Boodle? Boodle what? What's a Boodle Fight? A Boodle Fight is a feast set up on banana leaves. Just a food piled in the middle with everyone standing shoulder to shoulder. And the best part is, everyone eats with their bare hands. It originated with the Philippine military. Soldiers took the practice home and it went mainstream. So mainstream that chefs like Jaff now have full-time jobs bringing boodle fights to the masses. The boodle fight is a quintessential example of how Filipinos value sharing. Especially when it comes to food. A lot of food is needed for boodle fight to be enjoyed the way it's meant to be. We love Balintawak Market. This is where boodle fight comes together. We'll be needing the essentials. Pork, chicken, seafood, veggies, dessert, the sides, and of course, the fruits. And do not forget the star of the show, the banana leaves. Shush, I am full already. We start with the messy part, the grilling. First, the pork, chicken, the seafood, and then you slice the fruits, steam the veggies together with the shrimp and the crab, and then slice all the sides and prepare the table. After setting up the banana leaves, it is important to look for the center of the table and start from there. You can place the dessert and fruits. Then on both sides, start with the rice, pork, chicken, and seafood. To make it extra delicious, 
at the sides, literally on the side of the table. The Philippines has a lot of choices when it comes to food, but none compared to the community that develops when sharing a pile of food barehanded with the people you love. Cakes, cookies, and brownies. No, we're not going to show you how to make them because they can be made with ease thanks to Betty Crocker, who was born in 1921 in Minnesota. Well, kind of. In 1921, the Washburn Crosby Company, now known as General Mills, ran a contest for people to complete a puzzle for the most coveted prize, a pincushion. Yes, one of your very own. Surprisingly, a lot of people wrote in to claim their prize, but with a little PS. How do I make my sponges? How, much how long does how much flour, flour should I use? They wanted baking advice. So the customer service department began to reply, and to make their tips seem more genuine, they signed their letters Betty Crocker. Betty, because it was a cheery, all-around, American-sounding name, and Crocker after a board member. Not being a real person didn't stop Betty Crocker from having a very successful radio show, the Betty Crocker Cooking School of the Air, with a different accent in every state. Welcome to the Betty Crocker Cooking School of the Air. But the lies don't stop there. Let's talk about that added ingredient, the egg. You don't need to add a fresh egg to powdered cake mix, but science says it makes us feel like we aren't cheating and we're better providers. So thanks, Betty Crocker, for making us all feel like we know how to bake. <laughs>